Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening for the Chilton Society webinar series. This is the third in a weekly um, um, schedule, which was um, organized by the Chilton Society. And um, I hope you're all sitting comfortably for a, for a chat this evening. I'm Harriet Bennett. I'm a trustee of the Chilton Society. And this evening, for all you river enthusiasts, um, Kat Moncrief has very kindly agreed to um, give a presentation. She's got uh, international experience of um, working in freshwater policy and water security. So um, I think this is going to be a, a fresh perspective on um, the river issues um, and a good discussion this evening. So. If you'd like to answer a question this evening, please write it in the question and answer tab on Zoom. And after Kat's presentation, um, we will put a few of those questions to her. If that's all right with her. Um, I think that's all. So Kat, if you would like to share your screen, um, you can go ahead with your talk. It's fine. Thank you very much, Harriet, for that intro. I'm just going to make sure I'm sharing my screen properly. How's that? Excellent. OK, very good. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so my name's Kat or Catherine Moncrief. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about water this evening and particularly water in the Chilterns. Um, now, as Harriet said, I've worked on water issues around the globe. So I'm going to start by talking about water from a global perspective, actually, and then talk about why the issues that are happening globally on water are actually really relevant in the Chilterns. Um, and just a little bit more background on me. So I currently work at CDP, um, which is an organization, a charity that encourages companies to disclose on their environmental impacts, which includes their impacts on water, um, and disclose that information to their investors. And previous to that, I worked at WWF for a number of years, and I worked on in international conservation programs associated with water, and also on UK water policy and, and agricultural policy as well. Um, so that's me, um, and I'll get started. So I'm just going to make sure that this is working. Hang on, that didn't move the slide, did it? There we go. Can you see that new slide now? Brilliant. So water is the defining feature of this planet, and as I'm sure you know, fundamental to life. And I find this graphic very helpful, actually, in demonstrating the water that is available on our planet. So if you look at the one on the left-hand side, that blue blob shows how big compared to the size of the planet. If you put all the water together on the earth into a blob, that's how big it would look compared to the size of the planet. And then if you look at that smaller blob, which is over the United States, um, that is the fresh water on the planet. So only two and a half percent of the planet's water is fresh. The rest of it is salty in the oceans. And then if you've got really good eyesight, you might be able to see a tiny speck of blue below that little blob. Um, and that shows the water that is um, available in rivers and lakes. Um, so it's a tiny percent actually, tiny percent of the world's water. And some people actually prefer the graphic on the right hand side, which shows again that most of the water on the earth is salty and that two and a half percent is fresh. But most of that is actually locked up in ice caps and glaciers, um, about 79 percent. 20 percent is groundwater. And then that tiny little bit um, is water in lakes and water in soil and actually water in living organisms as well. So this just gives you an indication that the fresh water we have on our planet 
is quite a small amount. The fresh water that's actually available to use is really quite a small amount, um, especially when we think of the planet as a blue planet, actually only a small amount of that blue is available for our use. And I just wanted to highlight the importance of water um, in the context of the pandemic that we're living in at the moment. And I don't want to focus on this too much because I'm sure you're sick of hearing about pandemics, but it's really underlying the importance of clean water um, to humans. So frequent hand washing um, is really important for stopping the spread of the disease and particularly in places where there isn't that PPE available and perhaps it's more difficult to distance socially. Hand washing is absolutely vital for preventing the spread of, of diseases like COVID-19. Um, but also protecting our water resources is important in the long term for stopping the spread or the emergence of further zoonotic diseases like COVID-19. So healthy ecosystems, which include river and wetlands, are really important to ensure that those further diseases don't emerge. Okay. So on to a bit more about the world's rivers, lakes and wetlands and why they're so important. So they're important because they support ecosystems on which wildlife, like these lovely elephants, depend. But they're also really important to people. So I've already talked about how healthy ecosystems stop the spread of or the emergence of diseases like COVID-19. But they're also the basis of the fresh water that we all use in our daily lives. So water is abstracted from rivers and wetlands and lakes. Um, and the groundwater that feeds them to use in our homes. And it's also used in vast quantities to produce our food. So you can see this next slide, which shows out of the water that we pump from rivers, wetlands and groundwater, how much we use for different things. So you'll see that actually the the amount of water that we use in our homes is quite small, only 10%. The vast majority is used for agriculture, and then around 20% is used for industry. And actually, in the UK, which I'll talk about later, the picture is quite different um, because we generally have rain fed agriculture, and because we're a high population, we've got a high population density, most of our water. Um, is used in the home, about 55% of the water that's abstracted is used in the home and, and only about one or 2% is used in agriculture. So this is the global view that you have here, but the view in the UK is quite different. And just talking a little bit more about the importance of rivers and water for food production. So this is an aerial view of the Mekong Delta so where the Mekong meets the sea. And the water is obviously really important for the irrigation and you can see the irrigation, irrigated area there, all that green. And this is actually the, the bread basket or rice basket, if you like, of Asia or one of the major rice baskets of Asia. Um, but what's also important is that the river ecosystem itself transports down the river this sediment, which is really rich in nutrients and that the periodic flooding of the Delta actually provides the sort of fertilizer that enables this to be such a productive region. So I think this really, this, this picture is really nice and it illustrates the importance of water for growing our food, but also the importance of rivers and river ecosystems. And I just wanted to get that, that message across here. doesn't seem to want to move on that easily. There we go. So rivers are also really important for industry. So sectors such as metal smelting and refining, textile manufacturing, power generation, and even things like microchip manufacturing, they use vast quantities of water, huge amounts. And so I just thought it was important to realize that industry is really important user of water as well and the rivers that 
provide industry with the water they require are really important. And rivers are also crucial for lives and livelihoods. So back to the Mekong again, um, this is, the Mekong is, as well as providing all that lovely sediment to the Mekong Delta, the lower Mekong is also one of the largest freshwater fisheries in the world and provides proteins, protein to tens of millions of people in the lower Mekong. And so again, that river system is a really important source of food from that perspective, source of protein, um, and also supports many people's livelihoods. You can see all the fishermen and women here, um, which are buying and selling their fish and other goods on the river. And rivers aren't just important for food and industry, they also have really important social, cultural and spiritual benefits as well to people. And um, I think that's highlighted really nicely in this photo from the pilgrimage city of Haridwar on the Ganges. So it's where the Ganges comes out of the foothills of the Himalayas onto its floodplains. Um, so as I'm sure many of you know, the Ganges is worshiped um, and believed to be sacred by many. And so it's a really important river for spiritual purposes. So I just wanted to highlight that rivers are not just great in terms of providing water and fish and fertile soil, and they also have really important so social and cultural benefits as well. Okay, so what's going on with our rivers globally? We've got increasing pressure on the planet's water resources. So there's only a certain amount of fresh water available at particular times and in particular places. Um, but meanwhile, demand for water is rising as you can see from this graph. So as our populations grow our, and our demand for material goods grow and our, our standard of living increases, our demand globally for water is increasing. And this means that in many areas across the globe, we're running short of water. And so this presents a serious issue to entire economies and societies. And as you can see by that stat on the left-hand side, one in two people, so half of the world's population will be living in water-stressed regions by 2050. And I think it's about one in four at the moment. So one in four people living today are facing real water stress. And this is a map of global water stress. So water stress um, is the rate, ratio of annual water withdrawal, so water taken out from rivers and groundwater, ratio of that to the total amount available. And on this map where you see red and orange, that is showing where you've got major water stress. Um, so essentially the darker the color here, the darker the orange and the red, the greater the competition for water. And our eyes tend to be drawn to those areas that are red and orange, but actually the situation is bleak in a lot of places. So water stress touches almost every continent. And climate change is acting to exacerbate this water stress across the, world, across the globe. And I rather like this quote, it's from the chair of CDP, the organization that I, I work for at the moment. Um, and he said, if climate change is the shark, then water is its teeth. And this really speaks to the fact that water and climate change are very much linked and that the impacts of climate change are often felt through the lens of water. So through more intense and frequent storms, through flooding and through droughts. And these type of events will only act to exacerbate the water stress situation that we find ourselves in. Um, the availability of water will become more unpredictable. So there may be water lots of water, too much water available at some times when it floods, but too little at other times. And so it's going to become more difficult to predict 
um, our water resources that are available. And I also wanted to touch on pollution. So often, from a global perspective, the water challenges that hit the headlines are the floods and the droughts. Um, and the issues of water quality, by and large, have rather been underappreciated and unnoticed. Um, but the World Bank last year, or maybe it was 2019, um, undertook a huge analysis of the water quality data that existed across the globe and pointed to this crisis and an, an invisible crisis of pollution, demonstrating that 80% of the world's wastewater actually goes back to the environment untreated. And that's a huge threat to human health and ecosystem health. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that issue as well because it's also an issue, issue in the Chilterns that I'll touch on later. Okay, so what is the effect of this water stress, water pollution and climate change on nature and particularly on rivers and wetlands? So you may have seen WWF's recent Living Planet report, which pointed to the crash in freshwater species populations. So an 84% average decline in species, freshwater species populations since 1970. And that's a much bigger decline than for terrestrial species and other groups of species. So a crash really in freshwater ecosystems. Um, and the report found that major threats included modification and reductions to flows in rivers, pollution, over exploitation of certain species, invasive species, and also sand mining in rivers, which is quite big on the Mekong again, and also on some of the big rivers in China. The sand is needed for construction and economic growth. And that sorry picture there is the bargy dolphin, which is one of the species that has suffered from these threats. The bargy dolphin used to live on the Yangtze River in China, um, but a few years ago was declared extinct, um, which is very sad. And I actually know one of, the, one of the scientists that was trying to find the last bargy dolphin and didn't manage to. And I've heard him speak and he's written a book about it, which is fascinating, but very sad. Okay, so moving on from China to the Chilterns, is any of what I've said relevant to the Chilterns? So absolutely, yes. Um, but you may think, well, why? Because look at this beautiful photo, sorry, it's a bit blurry. This is a photo of the chess. It looks green, it looks clear. There's a lot of flow in there. Surely there's nothing to worry about, but there are things to worry about. So let me start by showing you a water stress map of the UK. So this is zooming in on that map that I showed earlier, but just focusing on the UK part. So the orange areas are where there is moderate to high water stress. And you can see that we have that situation um, sort of in Oxford, down the Thames Valley, southwest of London and parts of the Chilterns. Um, High Wycombe's rainfall is similar to the national average, which is about 800 millimetres a year. But going further east, um, say into East Anglia, rainfall reduces to about 500 millimetres a year. And at 500 millimetres a year, that's actually classed as semi-arid. So we may consider ourselves to be in a green and rainy country, but actually in some places, the climatic conditions are semi-arid and that may expand as climate change takes effect. Um, but what I did want to point out is this map doesn't necessarily reflect rainfall. Water stress is, as I described earlier, is, is essentially the pressure on our water resources. It's the ratio of water withdrawals to available supply. So this is showing where you have that pressure, whether essentially the, the rainfall coming in that's replenishing our rivers and groundwater 
is not a, not enough essentially to meet the demand that what's being taken out. And I want to just draw your attention to what the chief of the Environment Agency said a couple of years ago about this situation. He called it the jaws of, dread, jaws of death, sorry. Um, and he flagged in a quite widely reported speech that certain parts of the country would run out of water within 25 years. Um, and essentially when demand for water outstrips supply. Um, and he described it as the jaws of death because I think when he was doing his speech, he was referring to graphs like the one I've shown there, um, which, which many water companies produce in their business plan, which shows the trajectory of demand. So demand increasing that blue line and then supply, which can increase um, in some ways when new resources are, are developed. Um, but with climate change, that supply may in some places actually decrease. Um, and so it's almost like a set of jewels, I think, coming together. Um, but it was quite, I suppose, quite a, a sort of shocking image um, which he was painting of where our country could be in 20 or 25 years time. And just to highlight that graph that I've done of demand and supply in no way represents reality. I just wanted to show, illustrate what he meant by these jaws of death. Okay, so I painted quite a bleak picture. Um, what does this mean for the chalk streams of the Chilterns? So chalk streams are globally rare. Um, and just maybe just go back one step um, in that in the Chilterns, our water supply mostly comes from groundwater. So from the chalk rock, which makes up the Chilterns hills. And it's that groundwater that feeds our chalk streams. Um, and these chalk streams are, as I said, globally rare. So there's only about 200 chalk streams that exist um, in the world. And they mostly exist in South and East England. There are pockets of chalk streams in Northern France, but 85% of the chalk streams in the world exist in this country. And they're unique. So the water is filtered through the very fine chalk rock. And that means it has very clear water and that supports an array of species, including kingfisher, water vole, mayfly, brown trout, and many others. And these rivers are on the edge, they're suffering, and they've been referred to as Britain's burning rainforest, threatened by that jaws of death that I spoke about on the previous slide. So increase in population, <clears throat> and economic growth means that more water is being pumped from the chalk that, that feeds these streams to supply businesses and homes. Meanwhile, climate change means that more, water, more annual rainfall variability and therefore more, <coughs> sorry, more dry years when groundwater levels um, and therefore streams dry up. But you can see here just how beautiful they are with that very clear water. And we have seen them dry up in recent years. So you can see from that picture there, that's an example of a river. I'm not sure which one actually, but that dried up in 2017. So in spring 2017, we saw a number of rivers dry up across the southeast after a dry winter. Um, and in summer 2019 as well, we saw a number of these rivers reduced to <coughs> barren river beds. Excuse me, I'm just gonna have some water. And when these streams dry up, it obviously puts a significant stress on aquatic wildlife. Um, and the map on the right hand side shows where shows the rivers in, in England and Wales where there's over abstraction. So where 
we're pumping out too much water for, from the chalk for use or from wherever for use in homes, businesses and farms. And that's causing failure against good ecological status. And that good ecological status is the measure by which rivers and wetlands are assessed um, for their health. And then I've got a second map here, which shows where all the chalk streams are in England, or at least most of them. And the color on that map shows the ecological status again of these chalk streams um, as of 2019. So you can see that none of them are at good ecological status. Most are at poor or moderate status. And you can see the Y, the Misborn, the Chess, the Gade and the Ver, all there in orange and red. So it's a rather sorry state. Okay, and pollution is also a problem in this country and in, in the Chilterns as well. Um, so this map from the Rivers Trust shows sewer overflows, so where raw sewage mixed with rainfall or sometimes groundwater discharges directly into rivers or lakes or seas without being treated. And you may have seen the Panorama program about this last week. And it happens because at certain times the sewage treatment works can't really cope with the volume of sewage going through them. And that's maybe because of lots of heavy, heavy rainfall or because groundwater has ingressed into the sewer system. Um, and under the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, they're only supposed to discharge during unusually heavy rainfall, but they're actually discharging far more frequently. And that's because um, of under capacity in the sewer system, they haven't been invested enough. And also because of sewer blockages. So sewer, sewers can block when inappropriate items are flushed down loos and drains. So for example, wet wipes and sanitary products and kitchen fats, um, and as I said, it, it can also happen where you've got groundwater coming into sewers and that's what is happening in the chest. So because of the sewers being very old and having cracks in them, groundwater is leaking into those sewers and that's increasing the volume that's going to the sewage treatment works and they can't cope. And that means they have to have this overflow into rivers, which is why it ends up with more sewage in rivers, which is not a good situation. 72% um, of rivers in Thames Waters region are affected by sewage. Um, and in 2017, I think it was, they were fined a record 20 million um, for sewage discharge breaches. And you can see that little stat there. So on the 6th of April, um, data release showed that sewer overflows discharged untreated sewage and stormwater for more than 400,000 400, times and for more than 3 million hours during 2020. So this is happening just far more frequently than it should be. Um, so it's a big problem. And other pollution issues I just wanted to highlight. So, oh, sorry, going back, I think, Actually, something's missing there, but that's fine. Um, so industry, I don't know if you've heard of PFAs, which are sometimes called forever chemicals. So they've been found in drinking water and they can have huge health problems. And there's a legacy issue with them because they don't break down, hence why they're called forever chemicals. Um, agricultural pollution is also a major issue in this country. So from animal slurry, so chicken farms on the Y, which is what is cited in that article from the Guardian at the top, that's an issue. And also soil um, and runoff from soil containing agricultural chemicals such as nitrate and, and fertilizers such as nitrates and phosphates, that all runs into rivers um, and is not the use of chemicals and the management of farmland isn't well regulated. And so it's a widespread widespread problem in this country. 
Okay. I, I think that is, no. Okay. I'll move on to the slide. So, why a bit more on why we've got to this sorry state of affairs in this country. So, a few thoughts on this from my perspective. So, firstly, the regulatory framework has not been fit for purpose. So, I would say that we have a good set of laws and policies, but in many cases, these are not adhered to. So, continued cuts to funding of regulatory agencies has meant that we have a poor record in terms of clamping down on taking too much water out of chalk streams and putting too much sewage into them. And in addition, the Environment Agency at the moment doesn't have the powers to amend abstraction license, licenses that are sucking some of our rivers dry. And then secondly, in this country, we have, we have privatized water companies and I would say they haven't invested sufficiently in terms of upgrading the sewers and fixing leaks as well in their water supply pipes. Um, and arguably, they've been more focused on paying dividends to their shareholders. Um, and it's meant the current infrastructure that we have is not fit for purpose now, let alone for the future when we've got climate change biting. Um, and looking ahead, the Chilterns region is set for a lot of future house building. And we've got the Oxford Cambridge growth corridor to the north. And those things are gonna put more and more pressure on water resources and more demands on our sewer system. And there needs to be a huge investment program to fix what is very old and crumbling system that we have now. Um, and I just want to, refer back to some of the things that Michael Gove said about the water companies in 2018, um, being involved in sophisticated financial engineering and paying out dividends, um, big dividends and salaries without paying too much tax. Um, now, I think the situation has improved since then, but I just wanted to highlight some of the things he said. Um, and this was when he was Secretary of State for the Environment. So he said some companies have been playing the system for the benefit of wealthy managers and owners at the expense of consumers and the environment. And he also said water companies can be sure of the flow of income from households into their coffers than householders can be sure of the leak-free flow of water into their homes. And then on to my third point here. As a country, we failed to curb our thirst for chalk streams. Um, they're a very cheap source of water, which is great in some respects, especially with the political imperative to keep water bills low. Um, but also, you know, we have one of the highest water capita, the, sorry, that one of the highest per capita water consumptions in the country. So it sits at 170 litres per person per day, and that's well above what many European countries achieve. I think Germany's on about 120 litres per person per day. Um, currently, new homes must be built to a water consumption standard of 125 litres per person per day, um, but this could be much more stringent. So there's an optional buildings regulation requirement of 110 liters per person per day, which local authorities in water stressed areas can apply for where there's a need. Um, but I feel this can become the norm. And actually I've done some analysis in the past and it's perfectly, you can live perfectly well and feel like you're using the water you need um, and still only use 80 liters per person per day, that's perfectly achievable with a high standard of living. So what's being done to address some of these issues? So I first wanted to refer back to the Chalk Stream Summit, which some of you may have attended in the autumn. So we hosted that, the Chiltern Society hosted that um, through the Chalk Rivers Action Group. And it was hosted also by Rebecca Powell, the Water Minister at DEFRA, and chaired by Earl Howe, who's our patron. 
And the aim of the summit was to solicit commitments from senior decision makers, um, including the regulators and water company chiefs and um, the minister as well. So the summit was really encouraging in the sense that Rebecca Powell is very enthusiastic and clearly committed to this cause. And she said that many other MPs share her enthusiasm. So she spoke of chalk streams being a hot topic in the corridors of Westminster, which I rather liked the thought of really MPs whispering about um, chalk streams in the, in the corridors of the Houses of Parliament, although it's probably all on Zoom at the moment. Um, anyway, she outlined at this summit some policy commitments, which I think were encouraging or at least heading in the right direction. So a task force has been set up to tackle spills from sewers and the water companies are heavily involved in that. There's a new regional planning framework for water companies. Um, so water companies will be coming together to plan water resources at, at a regional level, and that will help identify alternative sources of water that should help reduce the reliance on chalk groundwater and chalk streams. We've also been promised a response to the 2019 consultation on water efficiency, which includes revisions to building regulations that I just spoke about. Um, and the Environment Bill finally should provide legally binding targets on water consumption and sewage pollution. And water companies are also playing their part. So at the summit, each of the key water companies in the area of the Chilterns laid out its plans to reverse the decline of, of chalk streams. Um, and we're already seeing some action. So Affinity Water switched off its pumps, which take water from the Upper Chest Valley Aquifer. Um, and this means when we have long spells of dry weather, the chest is more likely to stay flowing. And other switch offs are planned, which should help bring the Ver, the Mimram, and the Misborn back to life. At the same time, Thames Water is planning to stop pumping from the chalk aquifer at Horridge, which is also north of Chesham, and invest in other sources of water. And Anglian Water are building a 500 kilometer pipeline from the north um, down to the south and east. And some of that water will help alleviate the pressure on chalk streams in the Chilterns. So it feels like things are definitely moving in the right direction. Um, so these actions are all really encouraging and but there is a sort of sense that we've been here before and that we might be here again um, but following on from the summit a national chalk action plan is being developed with developed which builds on the commitments of the summit and so we need to ensure that this doesn't become a dusty document which sits on a shelf or in someone's file on a computer, but it's a living document and that we hold the government and water companies to account on it. Um, and part of that is about harnessing the passion of local groups. That's going to be really key to ensuring that the commitments that were made at the summit um, are kept to and also constructively challenging where appropriate. And I'll talk more, more on this in the next couple of slides. But generally, there was a sense after that, that summit that no organization can do this alone and that maintaining a strong constructive relationships will be really important and that everyone, in fact, has a role to play in ensuring that we, we don't find ourselves in the same place or in a worse place in 10 years. Um, and that brings me on to talk about what we as individuals can do, what our role is in tackling this issue. And I've got some water saving tips and tricks here, which I've pulled from a number of sources. Um, and I feel a lot of them are really easy to do and won't make a huge impact on people's lives. Um, and so I just thought it was worth running through them, but actually, water companies have a lot of really useful resources on this stuff, which it's worth um, tapping into for want of a better phrase. Um, but anyway, here are my quick tips. So in the bathroom, turning off the tap um, whilst brushing your teeth. 
So if the entire adult population of England and Wales remember to turn off the tap when they're brushing their teeth, we could save um, enough to supply nearly 500,000 homes, which is just incredible. Another tip is to take a minute off your shower. Um, and actually some water companies have shower timers, um, just little egg timers that you can stick on your shower wall. And um, I used to have one of those until it fell off and broke. So I need to get another one, but really useful because you've got no idea what the time is in the shower. Um, then in the kitchen, stopping drips. So a dripping tap can waste more than 3000 liters of water a year. Um, on the washing machine, ensuring it's full before putting it on. So a washing machine uses 55 liters of hot water per cycle. Um, and then in the garden, so think twice about using that hose pipe. So running a hose pipe for an hour uses a thousand liters of water. Um, and using a watering can instead can save you 25 liters for every 15 minutes you spend watering the garden. Um, if you do use a hose pipe, make sure it's fitted with a trigger nozzle so you can start and stop it so you're not kind of watering the pathway or the lawn as you move between flower beds. And actually, some water companies provide those for free. So get a water butt to collect rainfall from, from roofs. Um, and water in the evening is much better than watering in the day because you reduce losses from the soil and leaves um, from evaporation. And as I mentioned, I think it's really worth contacting your water company um, because they can offer free water saving advice and also devices. As I mentioned, my shower timer, which I need to get another one of, um, tap insert, shower heads, um, system replacement device in your toilet, which means that your the quantity of water in your flush is, is smaller. And you can also ask your company to install a water meter. Um, so knowing what you use is the first step in cutting waste, I think, um, especially as a quarter of all leakage that happens is in um, a householder's property. You could even save money if you get a water meter. Um, Affinity Water, so if you're their customers, um, you can get into their water fit initiative. So you enter your postcode and they ask you a few questions. I've done this and then they come up with some specific tips for you and offer a one-to-one -one consultation. So I definitely recommend doing that. Okay. Sorry, just moving on. Oops. So I'm on to my last couple of slides. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, I want to take us back to the global water crisis that I started out at the beginning with um, and talk about how we personally can help avert that to some extent about choices we make. So our total water footprint is much bigger that, than that sort of 150 or 170 litres of water a day that we use for, for washing and things in the home. Um, and that's because the food we wear and the clothes, sorry, the food that we eat and the clothes that we wear require a huge amount of water to make them or produce them. And that can, in some circumstances, leave communities in other parts of the world short of water. So for example, cotton is an extremely thirsty crop and many rivers are over abstracted in places like Pakistan and India where they're growing it. Um, then there's a lot of chemical pollution associated with textile manufacturing, particularly dyeing, huge amount of chemical pollution, toxic chemicals, um, and that is polluting waterways for people in, in other places. Our food requires a huge amount of water to grow it and also process it. Um, you may have heard stories about avocados and asparagus from Peru, which are depleting water resources for communities in um, Western Peru. Then those almonds from California, again, using huge amount of water resources. 
Um, now, it's a difficult one to navigate because the sort of labeling isn't there in place in supermarkets to understand the water footprints of your food, but it's something that's worth bearing in mind. Um, just a general rule of thumb is that it takes more water to produce meat um, than it does vegetables because the meat requires all of the, the fodder and things to, to um, grow, I guess. Um, so we hear a lot about the carbon footprint of meat versus vegetables, but there's also a water footprint there as well. So I just encourage you to, to consider that. And in the background, one of my ambitions in life is to make sure that the labeling on food is very clear about water use. Okay, and on to my final slide, having your say. So we need more water company, more voices, sorry, holding water companies and government to account on issues of water stress and pollution and also scrutinizing their plans. So for example, are Thames and Affinity Water making the best use of the water that they take from our rivers? And are they doing as much as they can to reduce leakage as well as help us increase water efficiency in homes and businesses? And are they asking the right questions of their customers? So would their customers, for example, be willing to pay an extra pound if they knew that that would help keep their rivers flowing? So by, my message here is really watch this space. So as the Chiltern Society ramps up our work on rivers and wetlands, one of the things we'd like to do is make it easier to approach your MP or water company about specific issues like this and also feed in your ideas and also campaign. So I'm personally quite inspired by the achievements of groups like the Ilkley Clean River Group. And you can see that article there from the Guardian. So they managed to achieve bathing water status for their local river. And that means water companies aren't able to discharge raw sewage into that river. A poll by the Rivers Trust at the top right there suggests that three quarters of people are concerned about this issue of sewage pollution in rivers. And they're worried that they're gonna get sick from paddling or swimming or boating or fishing or whatever they're doing in rivers. Um, so I wonder whether we can get some of our chalk streams and the Chilterns designated as bathing waters also. They don't have to be swimming spots. It's just where people enter the water to play, have fun basically. Um, and you'll see there that there's a river action group that's been set up to target agribusinesses who are polluting rivers with chemicals. Um, and then this one is really interesting. So in New Zealand, a river has achieved personhood and all the rights that come with that. Um, so that's a really interesting concept, I think, and something that we could explore potentially for rivers in the Chilterns. And as a society, we're also keen to help people link taps and toilets with rivers and even food with rivers. Um, because many people don't really think about where their water comes from or where it's going to, but they'd be horrified to know if, that their tap was leaving their river running dry or that what they were flushing down the loo was causing a blockage that was leading to raw sewage going into their local river. So I think um, we're really keen to, to make those connections a bit more obvious. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, for listening. It was much longer than I'd anticipated, actually. I thought I was only going to talk for 30 minutes, so I hope you found it interesting. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, I especially loved your infographics at the beginning and in the middle, and thanks for your wonderful photographs. Um, I think the trend for wild swimming can only help draw attention to, um, to our rivers. My husband's a very keen wild swimmer and doesn't seem too concerned about sewage, um, rightly or wrongly. Uh, just tell him not to swallow any of the water. Um, <laughs> I do have several questions which have come in. I, can I ask my own question, first of all, to say, why aren't we um, encouraged to use grey water more? you know, um, for flushing our loos and things. It seems a great waste of water to 
to to use wonderful fresh water for things like washing up and flushing our loos that doesn't seem to be mm. that seems to me to be a, a quick win but it hasn't really caught on why, yes. why do you think that is I think we don't have the sort of infrastructure the kind of house level infrastructure in place to do that I mean I think it it would be brilliant and I know it's been put in place in some sort of bigger building new developments office buildings mm -hmm. um I think retrofitting that into older buildings is going to be challenging but absolutely with all this new development that should be at the top of the list there's no reason why we can't use that grey water um for yeah for doing the washing up or whatever mm -hmm. Um, and actually, there are some developments out there which are completely water neutral that reuse all their water, their sewage as well, and they don't need to abstract anything. And the water that comes through the treatment processes there is, in, you know, completely healthy to drink. It's amazing. Um, but there's a bit of a hurdle getting people to, to feel comfortable, I think, about drinking water that was their sewage. Right, and I'm looking at the questions that have come in. Um, there are two about planning. One is, um, what is the criteria under current building regulations for water efficiency? And another note saying um, that somebody's had an extension built, that they were told by Wickham Planning they're not allowed to have a water butt. Um, the rainwater has to go into a soak away. So okay. I don't know how much you know about planning, but... Um, would I'm you like to comment I, on that? Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know too much about the ins and outs of planning. Um, that's really disappointing, though, about the water, but that, you know, that seems crazy. So I'd be interested mm. to hear more about that. Um, in terms of water efficient homes, that, as I said, there is a consultation on water efficiency that was done in 2019. We're expecting a response on that and crossing fingers that there will be something in there which creates more stringent water efficiency guidelines for new homes. Mm -hmm. Then the first question to come in, which I know is what everybody's very agitated about, is can we have confidence in Thames Water's plans to stop sewage being discharged into the River Chess? <laughs> um, they're taking it seriously. Um, Paul Jennings, who is um, the River Chess Association, who kind of leads the River Chess, River Chess Association, would be good to answer this one. Um, but I know from speaking to him that they are taking it seriously, um, but progress is likely to be slow because they've got to, there's a number of leaks all the way down I think it's the Vale Valley are going into Chesham and that's all this groundwater is going into those leaks and to fix those is going to be a lot of earthworks and investment and things so they are on it but I don't think we're going to see the problem stopping in the next year or two. Right. Um Gosh, there's suddenly a flood of um, questions, so we probably won't be able to answer them all, bearing in mind we've got five minutes left. Um, an interesting one is, could we get stronger protection for our chalk streams by acknowledging, acknowledging them as special areas of conservation? Well, yes. that's obviously a European designation, which probably we're not in a position to, to use anymore. How does that work? Yeah, I don't know about how protections are being translated exactly mm. from the EU, but I do know that it is an issue that these chalk streams and the Chilterns are not protected. Um, so some other chalk streams like the Itchen and the Test are, and that mm. affords them greater protection and gives the Environment Agency greater powers to stop uh, over abstraction mm -hmm. and other issues in those rivers. So I think yes, a campaign to get them to be at a higher protection status mm -hmm. is a great idea. Are these other rivers SACs or were um, they? I think the itch was a triple SI. Um, I'm not 100% sure about the test. Mm -hmm. 
Um, um, okay, does the water used by industry have to be fresh rather than salt water? It's an interesting question. So does the water have to be fresh? Um, well, it has to be fresh when it comes into our homes, um, but companies do use salt water so and desalination plants. But so, for industry, so for using it for metal sorry. smelting or... Oh, sorry. I, mic sorry microchip I production or... Um, well, I think it often does have to be fresh, not, not for all things. So, for example... Power, cooling water for power generation could be salty. We have to be careful that the salt doesn't sort of gum up and scale up things. Mm. Um, for many processes, you do need fresh water. And I'm thinking particularly microchip processing that requires super high quality water um, just because of the processes, the chemical process um, involved. And it's such an intricate piece of technology um but it's a yeah it's a good thought for sure um, and it is possible to for big industries to have their own in-house sort of desalination plants and if they're by the sea a lot of them do do that mm. but it's expensive and energy intensive so i've got a rather unusual thing somebody's raised their hand I'm not quite sure what to do about that um and I think the last, I will just have a look at that, but what, while you're answering this, I think would be the last question, which is um, quite controversial. Can the Chilton Society do more to name and shame the worst and best polluting businesses, farmers and water companies in the Chilterns? I think, I think we could do that. I think it's important though also to be constructive because there's a reason why companies, farmers, water companies are doing what they're doing. Um, and I think it's important to understand the reasons behind that and try and come up with, with a collaborative approach to address those underlying issues. Um, so I think it's a balance of calling out, but also working collaboratively to address those underlying issues. Hmm. Well, maybe uh, there's, you know, an award for architecture in the Chilterns. Maybe there ought to be some other award for uh, innovation in water efficiency or something like that. That's something the Chiltern Society could run. Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid with time running out and my technical skills, I'm not sure I'm able to sort out this raised hand. Um, so I think that'll be something we have to discuss offline. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much. That was a really, really interesting um, view on the Chilton Talk Streams and uh, a really fun way to spend an hour this evening. So thank you so much and thank you everybody for participating and um, hopefully see you again in a week. <laughs> Goodbye everyone. Thank you.